So, have any of you ever, you know, filmed a video, maybe your wrap up, late at night, because you're trying to get a jump start on it, and then later on, upon looking back on what you filmed and realizing that it's almost entirely unusable, it is an hour and a half of you rambling. Or am I the only one? <laughs> hey folks, my name is Jen, and today I'm here to chat with you about everything that I read or did not read in February. <laughs> so, um, reading seems to be a little bit of a struggle again for me this year, so that's fun. And by reading, I mean sticking to any plans that I have for the most part, so we'll see how March winds up. But, so yeah, I have a bunch of things that I read and did not quite finish for February, so let's um, get into those things. <laughs> so first I guess let's chit chat about the stuff that I did actually finish reading. So I was trying to take part in the Febregion series on and I completed almost none of the challenges. <laughs> So, one of the challenges was to read a Feb Regency, a Feb Regency, a Regency Hour poem, which I did manage. Um, I read actually five poems out of this collection of Robert Burns' poetry. Of these poems, the ones that I did read were uh, addressed to the Uncle Good, uh, Tam Sampson's Elegy, a Winter Night, um, Lament of Mary Queen of Scots, and also um, My Heart is in the Highlands. So out of all of those, I think the ones, I mean I didn't mind Address to an Uncle God because I found a lot of humor in that one. Um, but I think my favorite out of the bunch was My Heart is in the Highlands. It made me think a lot about Scotland. And I posted about it on Instagram, but it just made me feel a little bit of that. Uh, Fernwa, our far sickness, where it's like you feel homesick for a place you don't know at all, which is very much uh, what I feel for Scotland a lot of the time, even though I've never set foot there, and I don't know if I'll ever set foot there because shit's expensive, but yeah. So I I really liked that one. I think it was my favorite out of the five that I read. Um, my issue with making my way through Robert Burns's poetry for the most part has to do with the fact that A, <laughs> uh, his poems are quite long. Uh, when it says poems, it honestly feels more like ballads. There is a section of ballads within this collection that I have not really gotten into, uh, but it just feels like they drag on for a very long time. <laughs> and I think the other part of that and where I can't really get through the very long poems is because it's mostly in Scots and that is a little bit hard to read. Um, or at least kind of hard for me to read, I end up having to try to read the poems out loud to myself so I can even decipher part of them, and I don't do a very good Scottish accent, to be completely honest. In fact, it's probably offensive, so um, I don't think that's very <laughs> helpful, and it's also not helpful for me to get glean any like context um, from what I'm reading. Now, I was able to find a couple of his poems being read by people um, in videos here on YouTube so I could get a better idea as to what uh, they are supposed to actually sound like or be about, um, but a lot of the ones that I tried to look up, there don't seem to be any recordings of people reading them, or at least not I could find videos, so um, that makes it a little bit harder to get through. I did, however, <laughs> I didn't read this poem out of here, but I did uh, see um, a 
couple of different videos of his poem addressed to a haggis, which is hilarious by the way, and I do definitely um, encourage people to read that one. I'll leave links to the two videos that I watched down below. I, I really liked the difference between the two videos of men reading these poems because one is done by a gentleman. Oh, I don't remember his name, but I think he might be like a stage actor. And uh, he reads it in, I think, the way it was intended, which was entirely uh, comedic, and it's wonderful. But uh, the other version that I saw is read by Sam Hewen, who plays Jimmy Fraser in Outlander. And uh, <laughs> it's just really interesting. He didn't take the comedic way with it. He went serious and straight on with his looks and his accent because it's like, okay, Sam, we know you're a dreamboat. Why are you doing this? You know Robert Burns meant this to be silly. Um, it is, yeah, it's just interesting to see these two different versions of the poem as well. And like I said, I'll leave a link in the description box below so you can see these videos and kind of see what I'm talking about. So yeah, I, I did read like five poems, which is four more than I needed to. So that was something. <laughs> Next thing that I completed uh, was The Camp by Richard Brinsley Sheridan. And this was for Feb Regency. It was the Regency era play. In all honesty, I kind of wish that I had just reread The Rivals because I had a much better time reading The Rivals last year than I did this play. I think part of that was due to not having maybe the music because this is technically a musical and I did look online really hard for any like production video that I could view of of anyone having put this on so I could get an idea about what the music was like and like see performances because plays are ultimately, I mean, you can read them and enjoy them, but they are ultimately meant to be experienced. You're supposed to be watching them happen and get all pulled into, you know, the story and everything. And uh, it just was, n I didn't have a good time trying to read this uh, play. It's taking place um, at a British uh, regimental encampment apparently during the Revolutionary War, but in all honesty, it feels like this could take place at any time in a British, British regimental, like, encampment anywhere between the 1700s to uh, the late 1800s. There, there was no, like, it didn't feel like there was really any context on setting it in that particular era at all. I did really like uh, the character of Nell. I thought she was a very strong character. I like that she's very feisty and opinionated and that she doesn't believe in just letting someone uh, say whatever they want or act however they want or try to bribe her just because they're an authority figure. She's not going to put up with that shit. And I really enjoyed that about her. Um, there is also... Uh, a couple that are in here and one of them, uh, Nancy, she ends up um, dressing up as a soldier and joining uh, the army to try to get close enough to her love um, who is, is he like a captain or a sergeant or something? I don't know. He's in, um, he is in the army though. Yeah, she just does this so you can get close to him, and I, I would have liked to know more about their story and moving forward, what's going to happen, because it felt like it, it kind of left off at a weird point, and there wasn't really any resolution from what I could read. It was like, is she, are they going to continue the ruse of her pretending to be a soldier and going and being with him um, and being secret about it? Did she just do this and now she's going to go back to her life? Did she do this to prove she's in love with him? Did she do this just to say bye to him and yeah, now she's going to go 
back and it's like, well, they'll be together later or something. Like, what was the resolution? It didn't really feel like there was any. And the other thing that I kind of had an issue with in this play is more to do with this particular um, copy and not necessarily the play itself. And that is that there is no context in here at all. Um, there's like tiny little bits in here about uh, like descriptions of who the characters are, but there is nothing else. Like I know that Nell enters the first scene holding a basket. I know that Nancy is dressed in men's clothes. She's pretending to be a soldier. Um, I know that the character of Odob, which who is a painter, which is funny and that's that is kind of a funny little um, play on words uh, thing that Bryn, um, Sheridan employed in the rivals as well having like characters kind of closely named to what their personality or their station is in life it seems to be something that he he did a lot um, in his writing and it but we don't really get any other descriptions of them beyond that and there's no context about this play. There's no footnotes, there's no um, introduction, uh, there's, yeah, there's no like foreword, there's no like anything, any notes giving us an idea about what was going on in Sheridan's head when he wrote this. Um, is there any background information? This is literally just the play with crappy um, background on it, that, like descriptions and like a no background context at all and I mean it's really nice that this group is publishing like rare plays but it feels like you know they could have at least like slapped an essay about like the background story of this play in there or something uh, instead of just throwing us to the literary wolves basically and trying to figure out shit as we go and that's honestly that's not really how I operate especially with something that is as old as this is I need a little more uh, context for the time period the messaging the the stuff like that it's just like when you start reading a Shakespeare and they have those like big long chunks of information at the front I usually read those or at least skim through them for pertinent information so I have some kind of idea about what I'm getting into and I feel like it was really a lackluster experience to not have the ability to have that option of looking through something for more information about this rather than just going in blind. Um, so ultimately yeah this this wasn't um, I think I don't even think I laughed out loud once. I think like one thing in here amused me and the rest of the time was just kind of uh, ambivalent about it. I ended up giving this three stars and I kind of wish I'd just reread The Rivals. <laughs> the next book I read was actually not for um, my monthly TBR but was just a book that I was trying to like make my way through. Um, and that was Mort by Terry Pratchett. Uh, so this is following Mort, who he's a little bit unambitious. He, he is in need of an apprenticeship and his dad ends up getting him an apprenticeship with death, <laughs> basically. Uh, this is set in Discworld, which is this world that Terry Pratchett made up. This is book I want to say four or five chronologically in the series and yeah so he becomes this apprentice to death and is kind of like going along learning the ways of when people's time have come going you know reaping their souls and stuff like that and uh, along the way he ends up having to go reap the soul of a young princess who's about to be killed and things happen that were not really supposed to happen and now the world's in trouble 
So yeah, shenanigans. I really enjoyed this. I actually started reading this, I want to say like last year at some point, or maybe it was 2021, and I don't know. I, I think maybe it was, I think it was 2021, and I think I was just still a little bit in like the full pandemic throes, and I was like, you know what, maybe reading about a character named Death right now is not the good thing for my mental anything, so I set it aside, and uh, I am really glad that I went back to it um, this past month, though, because I, I had a really good time reading this, and I actually really like the character of Death a lot. I think he's hilarious, and he loves cats, and... I mean, that says a lot about a person if they really love cats. <laughs> so yeah, I just, I really enjoyed this. This went some places I didn't know it was going to go, but I thought it was absolutely hilarious. And I just love the, the way that Terry Pratchett wrote satire of like our society in general. And I just... It was just such a a really good time um, and I very much enjoyed it. I ended up giving this like four stars. Then the next thing I read was part of my TBR for the month and that was Get a Life Chloe Brown by Tully Hibbert. So this is about Chloe who is a chronically ill IT person? Computer geek? Yeah she's got like skills. I think she has like her own company too. Um, but yeah, so she had recently a near-ish death experience and it scared her so much she decided she needed to make a to-do list of ways to force her to get a life essentially. And it's like ride on a motorcycle, go camping for the first time, um, have lots of like unattached crazy sex and also do something bad among a list of other things. <clears throat> and she ends up enlisting her kind of mysterious secret painter apartment superintendent to help her with this list because she thinks he's a bit of a bad boy and he, he can definitely help her get a life. So a couple of things about this book. First of all, uh, I I was a little thrown to be honest. So from the description on the back and things that I had heard, I was ultimately assuming that this was kind of like close to my favorite romance trope, which is fake relationship that ends up being real. So yeah, I was assuming that it was like similar to that or like maybe not in that vein but it was like hey we're just gonna have this loosey-goosey thing and then that ends up being real so I was pretty jazzed about that but then <laughs> it turned out to be it's more of an enemies to friends to lovers situation which is not my favorite trope. I I was a little bit like oh man but yo that like the enemy stage thankfully did not last that long. <laughs> I another little like fun factoid is somehow I didn't realize that this was taking place in England. So that was like an added bonus of ooh because it's written I think Talia Hibbert is British which I did not realize because I I honestly don't think I've really read that many romance novels that are set in the UK that are actually written by people who are British and not just Americans writing what they think the Regency period was like. Like I, so that was a new experience and I liked it. <laughs> also, I just really enjoyed my time reading this book. It was steamy. And I mean steamy, like, yo, they, they hadn't even, like, they hadn't even done 
like a lot of stuff. Like I hadn't even done like a lot of stuff. Like they hadn't like there was no horizontal cha cha going on, and it was still in the anticipation, man. It was so freaking steamy. I was enthralled, and like I am not someone who likes it when we we take a while to get to the stuff so <laughs> I was but I was I was enthralled I was not bothered uh by the antis I love the anticipation and like this was this was just damn and I also really liked that the characters really they're not like perfect people but it's also not like a situation of, well, this person has to fix me or I have to fix them or something like that. It wasn't like that at all. It was more like two flawed people working on their shit, but able to do that together. And that is something that I have been discovering within like romance novels over the past couple of years that I have really been enjoying because I've read like a lot of romance novels for like years now and after a while I just get kind of tired of reading the same shit over and over again but I don't think I will get tired of people like figuring like their shit out but healthily with each other I there's just something so endearing about that and it's like so different from the romance that I grew up reading that it's just it's such it's so good and I just I really enjoy it and I really liked both of the characters themselves as well and I really also liked the representation that was in here because we have um some like chronically ill rep which again not something that I, I've ever read about a character, I think, in a romance novel, um, you know, going through that before. And uh, also just, you know, dealing with, like, depression and toxic relationships and stuff like that. And I really liked how all of that was handled in here. And I think that was done very well. But overall, I had a really great time reading this. And I can see where all the hype is. And I definitely can't wait until I let myself buy books again because I want to pick up the other two pronto. So I gave this one five stars. The last two books I read. No, I lied. <laughs> Not the last two, but two more books that I read. I. Uh, so I'm not going to get into the whole backstory on this, but basically I was talking to my husband about um, uh, vampire, like, romance, not, like, paranormal romance novels and, like, vampire romance novels and stuff like that, because I was very heavily into paranormal romance when I was in high school and, um, college. And <laughs> I read a good chunk of it, you know, like, I watched True Blood like crazy, it was all into the Sookie Stackhouse books, um, read some other stuff that I can't quite remember but there's definitely like a dragon in it and I don't know, dragon people I don't know um just demons stuff like that I read like a lot of random uh things a lot of werewolf stuff too but I also was super duper into vampire romances and uh one of the series that I was into back then uh, I can't remember if it's called the Undead series or the Queen Betsy series because I've heard it referred to as like both of those but it's by um, Mary Janice Davidson and this was a series that one of my best friends was like super into at the time so I used to like borrow the books from her. I can't remember how many I read. I think I got about like six books in I want to say maybe at the time. I ended up um, borrowing a couple of ebooks and rereading the first two books in the series. Uh, so those were Undead and Unwed and Undead and Unemployed. The series is following Betsy, uh, full name Elizabeth Taylor. Yes, she knows about all the jokes. Uh, she prefers going by Betsy. She had a really bad day. Uh, she 
lost her cat, she lost her job, and then when she's out in the middle of the street trying to grab her cat that she found, she gets hit by a car and dies. Only she didn't really, she woke up at the funeral home and guess what? She's a vampire. <laughs> so uh, not only is she a vampire, but she has special abilities and they think she is the prophesized queen of the vampires who's gonna like rule all of vampire kind and there's also this like kinda broody, kinda sexy old vampire named Sinclair who is like super duper into her. So, so I can't really remember how I felt about this series back then other than I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> um, that's legitimately the only thing I remember. Um, or did I find Sinclair attractive? I think so. I forgot some pieces of this series, namely that there's like um, a interesting sex scene fairly early on in the book, and by interesting I mean slightly questionable, and also, um, now I had to suffer through this, so you're going to have to as well, uh, but the words, his turgid cock <laughs> were used, um, <laughs> uh, okay, so, yeah, so that was, <laughs> excuse me, I'm like 13 years old, and I can't, uh, deal with that. Oh my god. Um, that was something, and <laughs> see that's the thing about this series is that largely it is a comedic series. It is supposed to be really funny, but the other side of it is that it is technically also a romance series, and I don't know if the author means to be funny a hundred percent of the time. It's kind of hard to tell. <laughs> I don't know if she is trying to be really funny 90% of the time and then 10% of the time it's supposed to be really titillating and uh, it's not like even the sex scenes that I read in the over the two books are all very odd and I laughed the entire time. I'd, and the thing is, is, again, I don't know if they were supposed to be funny. I don't know if those are supposed to be the only parts that are taken maybe a little seriously or what. Or if she means the whole thing to be hilarious, because it, it was just... The words that were used, the situations, just absolutely ridiculous. And I just... I was uh, just amused. Yeah, I, I don't even know. Um, I, I also <laughs> really did not uh, like Betsy that much. Um, she's very... <sighs> shallow. Uh, she's just really obsessed with shoes. Like, really obsessed with shoes. Like, she's just on about her shoes. And I, I mean, I guess there's a couple of characters that she does feel something for, but for the majority of the time, it's just shoes this and shoes that and her obsessing over shoes and what about these shoes? She's very easily bribed with shoes and, like, I don't... No, it, it just got a little bit tiring after a while. <laughs> and again, I only read two of these. I was just about done with her shoe fascination, fascination uh, by, I want to say like halfway through book one. So, and I mean, maybe I'm just not getting it because I've never been like that. Like, I... Ugh, wear Converse high tops, and I have worn Converse high tops almost exclusively as shoes since junior high, and I mean partially that's because I think they look cool, but the majority of the reason is because I have flat feet and they're like one of the only shoes that I've ever felt comfortable wearing. I could give a rat's ass about anything else of their products, and I don't really understand the fascination with owning a pair of shoes that costs like a month's rent. Like I just, I don't understand the draw and half the time the shoes look so ugly or I can't even tell the difference between like designers. Like I, I don't, I don't get it. So I was just very much over 
all of that. It, it just was like, is this like the vampire version of Sex and the City or something? Like I could not care less. And the other thing about this is that, so these books were, I can't remember when the first one was published, but I, I, it was sometime in the early 2000s, I believe. And that's the thing about these books is there were some things that were made as jokes in the series uh, involving a little bit of bigotry, um, not really homophobia, but kind of almost borderline, and a potential assault that was maybe an assault but maybe not at the same time but it was almost treated like a punchline to a joke and I wouldn't say like the the bigotry and homophobia was like in your face it was more like it was like microaggressions around those and the thing is is that it made me a little bit like Ugh, when I was reading it but then I had to remind myself that these were books in the early 2000s and much like I guess a good comparison would be the American Pie movies um, much like the American Pie movies they are very <laughs> much a uh, time capsule of what was acceptable to joke about at that time that is no longer societally acceptable um, to make fun of and I think yeah what I'm saying is that I don't think they aged that well um, I did end up giving both of them like four stars because despite everything I did laugh a hell of a lot whether or not the funny bits were supposed to be funny or not um, and by that I mean the sex scenes those were just I amusing but I honestly I really don't know if they were meant to be amusing or not but I still found them amusing because it was utterly ridiculous uh, so yeah but I don't know I have mixed feelings about how I rated it but I also have to remember that again these came out then and some stuff was socially acceptable which is not anymore <laughs> that was um those oh the last book I read was actually a reread and uh, it was because I filmed my poetry recommendations video and then was like you know what I feel like reading a whole bunch of poetry so I reread good poems which is a collection of poetry that is um, was chosen by Garrison Keillor and while there are poems that I'm not particularly fond of in the collection, there are still a bunch of them that I did really enjoy and some of them that I didn't have marked as like favorites uh, when I first read it, but I I felt more about them now and I, I marked them down as like favorites this time around. Um, which, I mean, hey, I suggest doing that if, if you're into poetry or or whatever uh revisit different things every couple of years or so and see if you feel differently about them i mean with any book really i think i think most books should be reread every few years or so so you can see you know if you get anything more out of them now or not because sometimes uh you will <laughs> So, things that I didn't quite finish. Stuff that was on my <laughs> monthly TBR. I did not make it through the female Quixote. I only got, where am I, chapter 10? Yeah, I only got the chapter 10 in here. While it's definitely amusing, I really don't like Arabella. Um, so... I will finish reading this book. I don't know if it's going to be this year or not, but I do plan on coming back to this book. I do really want to finish reading it, but I just dislike Arabella a lot, even though I, I really like seeing her make dumb, dumb decisions because <laughs> um, she's dumb. <laughs> but 
at the same time, I, it's just a little hard for me to get through a book when I really strongly dislike the protagonist. So yeah, I'm just going to pause in this for a while and I'll come back to it or may, I'll slowly make my way through it as time goes by. Uh, something else I didn't finish. I didn't get around to An Unconditional Freedom because I did not finish reading A Hope Divided. I am a few chapters in. Uh, I'm really liking it. I do really enjoy uh, both of the uh, main characters. I, I think they're really interesting people. I can't wait to know more about them over the course of the story. Uh, this is starting out very differently from how the first book in the series went and I kind of like that. Uh, one thing though was I was like a lot of the times I read um, whatever I'm currently reading like it in the hour or so before I go to sleep for the night and I can't really do that with this because there is a character that was introduced that I oh, she's agitating me so much like if if I could reach through the pages of this book and throttle this person, I would. Um, so I can't really read this as a before bed book because she agitates me to no end. Um, and I shouldn't really be agitated before bed because I need to be calm before bed so I can go to sleep. Uh, so yeah, I do want to come back to this. I'm I'm going to try to read more in this when I'm able to uh, this month in March, but if I'm not able to, I definitely plan on, on finishing this up in April. Uh, I also started reading Weird Sisters by Terry Pratchett, which is the ne next book chronologically, I believe, and this is more about uh, the witches in Discworld, and I absolutely love it. We see Granny Weatherwax again, and I just love Granny Weatherwax. Okay, then the books that I uh, DNF'd. I DNF'd three books this month. So the first thing I DNF'd was actually my nonfiction read for Feb Regency, and that was Jane Austen's Secret Radical by Helena Kelly. Uh, I wanted to like this so much because it, it sounded in concept so good. You know, some more information, like going into the more subversive views that Jane Austen might have been trying to put through in her in her novels and I really liked you know the idea of looking at things <laughs> through that kind of lens and I really enjoyed like the the introductory section about Jane Austen herself that gave us more context to like her family and her position in society and where things were with her writing and her family and everything and and also giving some context as to what was going on in the country and the world and stuff like that at the time I thought that was just a really good way to start this novel I think it was very clearly well researched and I, I very much enjoyed that I found a lot of stuff that was very interesting to me, things I want to look up um, further, and things that I was like, ooh, I really like that, you know. Uh, but then the next bits of the book are going into uh, each of her novels chronologically by from when she wrote them, and then it's tying it to stuff that's going on in her life at the time and getting more into the books themselves and also the more radical things that Jane Austen was trying to say in her books. So chronologically the first book technically would be Northanger Abbey and as much as I absolutely adore Pride and Prejudice and Persuasion, I do think that ultimately Northanger Abbey is my favorite of her novels. It's just so different from the others that I've read of hers and I just, I really like it. I like the playful nature of it. I like Catherine as a character. Um, Tilney is an interesting like uh, friend and love interest and I I just really enjoy the book. There's something so playful and satirical about it that isn't quite as pronounced in um, the other three novels of hers that I've read, uh, Persuasion, Pride and Prejudice, and Sense and Sensibility. So um, I just really love 
Northanger Abbey. So maybe I'm a little bit sensitive about someone basically disparaging the hell out of Northanger Abbey and also basically trying to get across that Northanger Abbey is more about, uh, as the author says here, sex can kill you. All of Jane's heroines, all of the women in her novels who marry are taking a terrifying risk. They're placing their lives potentially in the hands of their husbands. She basically spends the entire chapter trying to outlay to us the the many ways in which Jane was basically saying that, you know, I don't know, <laughs> love is a lie, women are just settling, sex can kill you and the men don't care. Um, it's basically like the whole thing in that chapter and I just uh, mm, didn't like that. I know that Jane like uh, didn't marry and there were things about maybe there was this guy or there wasn't or there was this thing or whatever, I don't know. But it's just, I don't know. I Again, that we don't know her, and this author says it very well that we don't know her. And it's like, yeah, we don't. So why are you making assumptions about knowing her when you've just said that we don't know her and we don't know what her, her ultimate whatevers were or what was going on with the... We don't know her unless you have a time machine and you went back and asked her, Yo, Jane, how'd you feel about children and sex and stuff? Like... you. So, I don't know. I was just, I was, uh, mm, first of all, bothered about, uh, how much, uh, venom it felt like she had towards, uh, the characters of Northanger Abbey, how, um, her way of interpreting things, again, by saying ultimately, well, we don't know Jane, but then making her own assumptions about what, how Jane felt, and there's also this little bit, so it's really a good thing that I don't plan on making money off of this channel because I get demonetized with the, you know, the other words and now this. Um, so there's a section in the book where, so Catherine has read a gothic novel and she's very um, obsessed with this idea that the Abbey, where she's been invited to stay, is potentially um, haunted by the ghost of the murdered Henry Tilney's murdered mother, the whatever. Okay, so she's she's in the guest room and she decides to start rifling through this big old wardrobe that is also in the guest room with her, you know, as you do. And the description of her looking for the stuff, it just says her heart beat quick, but her courage did not fail her. With a cheek flushed by hope and an eye straining with curiosity, her fingers grasped the handle of a drawer and drew it forth. You know, and it's just basically like this big old description of her excitement and hope of finding, you know, the secrets <laughs> behind what these things that she's imagined has happened to Henry Tilney's poor mother. And just looking at this thing. And, you know, it's like if you were a teenager who was curious about stuff and you were nosy and... You went poking around, even though you know in your head you maybe shouldn't, because you got a little bit of that, like, you know, you read Harry at the Spy when you were little, and you're like, I can sneak around and stuff, like, unless I was the only nosy teenager, I don't know. But, like, I, you know, so I get it. You get excited and flustered about stuff, because you're like, oh boy, what can I possibly find? And it's like, it's always nothing. It's something boring. So, that's kind of like this whole thing here. So, this author... Uh, decided to take it <clears throat> a different way. And I quote, Let's not mince words here. With all those folds and cavities, the key, the fingers, the fluttering and trembling, this looks a lot like a thinly veiled description of female masturbation. I have it noted here, this is the funniest shit I've ever read. I laughed so much, I laughed so much, I, my cats ran in the other direction. Like, okay, Freud. Um, sometimes 
a cigar is just a cigar. Now, sometimes cigar is also a penis, but the majority of the time, the cigar is the cigar. The cigar is the cigar. The apples are just a basket of apples. And sometimes opening the fucking cabinet is opening the cabinet and not diddling your bits. Like, I... Oh my goodness. As soon as she said that, I was like, I can't take this person seriously anymore. Does she have a degree? I just, I don't, I don't, I don't. The very next book that she was going to get into was Sense and Sensibility. And I started reading the chapter because I was like, you know what, I didn't really like that book, so I don't really care if she disparages it, but I just could not get my mind off the other stuff she'd said to the point where I was like, you know what, I don't care. I do not care. And so I DNF'd it. And, um, uh, it's going in the donation pile. So the next two books I, um, DNF'd are kind of for a little bit of a project video idea that I'm working on. Um, <laughs> so I, to be honest, didn't go into these books with a lot of hope that I would really enjoy them, but I did not expect that I was going to DNF them or DNF them as quickly as I did. They're both Colleen Hoover books. <laughs> uh, the first was Verity, which I started with that one because I know that it's like a thriller and I figured, oh, well, this is most likely one of the ones that I would like because it's a thriller. Uh, I stopped reading that pretty much by the end of the first chapter. I almost stopped reading it on the first page because there is a description. Um... Now, I'm someone that I, I don't like a lot of gore. Um, I don't like watching gore and I don't li really like reading a lot of it. Um, I will sometimes, uh, I basically the level of gore I can handle is Stephen King. And even then, sometimes he almost gets my goat. So I don't, um, I don't do well with certain descriptions of certain things. And basically, the opening scene is the main character witnessing a man get run over by a truck in a way that I am not going to describe to you because I am trying desperately to not have that image created into my brain hole again. Um, it was very upsetting. I almost returned the ebook immediately, but then I was like, no, I gotta, I gotta give this a good old college try. So I kept reading and made it to the end of the chapter, and because of this circumstance, the main character meets um, basically the guy who's gonna offer a job, and I was like, this situation is just, no, you know what, I'm done. I just, I could not get that, uh, image out of my brain. So I stopped reading because no. Um, and then the next one that I went with was It Ends With Us because that is so popular. And um, I think I also only made it into the first chapter or so because the uh, main character basically watches um, the guy that I'm I have seen reviews of this since so I know it's the guy who's going to be like the love interest uh, in a little bit um, but it's basically her introduction to him was uh, watching him come out onto a rooftop and beat the ever-loving shit out of inanimate objects and her first thought is not <laughs> one of terror but more of like um, intrigue and interest and uh, I don't even know how to unpack that <laughs> exactly um, when I know everybody is is different and they deal with things differently but frankly having had uh, in a previous relationship, watched a grown man pick up an inanimate object, um, uh, such as a laptop, and watch him in anger rip it down ways in half. Uh, you know, 
I don't, I can't stomach uh, that stuff at all. Um, it gives me some feelings that I really don't want to deal with. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I DNF'd that as well. Um, and I will honestly, that's probably it for Coho and me because uh, I usually will give authors a two book try and this was our two book try. So yeah, um, if you do like her books, um, I mean, that's, I'm glad you found something that you like, but I, I can't. Um, and if you don't like that and anything bad to say, please don't come at me. I don't have the energy um, to justify why I can't, um, I can't do her writing, so. Yeah. So that was my month. That was a weird reading month. Over all, I've actually never DNF'd um, this many books this early in the year, so that was a weird feeling. Uh, but yeah, um, so far March is doing pretty okay. I'm already one book down and it was a good one, so that's fun. Um, I am hoping, I'm very hopeful actually, that March will be a much better reading month uh, overall. But, I mean, there were a couple of books that I did read this month that I, I did really enjoy, and there's the other books that I'm, I'm still currently technically reading. They're just going to go on to my... I mean, this one is my lunchtime read, so I'm still actively reading that one. And then the others are just my nice stand to shame. I'll come back to them. <laughs> anyway, that was my reading month. Um, sorry if I rambled a little too long. Uh, Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, let me know what your reading month was like down below. Um, if you participated in Fabricacy, let me know if you also failed like me or if you if you ended up, um, uh, you know, having, completing it, basically. Uh, but yeah, thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for always watching. If you're new here, please consider subscribing. And I will see you guys in a future video.